After 24 long, long years, <laughs> Canada's only NBA team, the Raptors, has truly hit the big time. And while the game of basketball was invented by a Canadian, it's taken a long time for it to get here, a spot in the NBA Finals, a sizable contingent of Canadian-born NBA players, and a strong national team. Jay Triano is one of this country's basketball pioneers. He was head coach of Canada's Olympic team and is assistant coach for the NBA's Charlotte Hornets. Oh, and of course, he was the first ever Canadian NBA head coach when he was at the helm of your Toronto Raptors. His new memoir is called Open Look, Canadian Basketball and Me, and he joins us now for more. Hi. Hi. It's nice to see you, Coach. Great to be here. Great to um, be here. I know you'd rather see the Hornets in this position. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of trash talk, yeah. uh, but how special is this run uh, the Toronto Raptors are on now? Uh, it's fantastic. It's yeah. fantastic for, you know, Canadians to be able to witness this and, and people in who have been part of the organization for the first 24 years mm -hmm. to finally see it uh, culminate in a, you know, being in the finals and the spotlight of the basketball world now mm -hmm. is, is on Toronto and on the Raptors, which is really cool. And no more groans when players, you know, come yeah. to Toronto, it's like, oh, Toronto. Yeah. But before we get in, more into basketball mm -hmm. and talk about your book, yeah. um, I want to show the shot that led us here. Yeah. Uh, Sheldon, could you please roll? It's off the Leonard, defended by Simmons. Is this the dagger? And they can feel it here. For the first time in Toronto Raptors 24 year history, they will be headed to the NBA Finals. There you go, Kawhi. Uh, I mean, just that moment, that yeah. energy, seeing like Drake on the court yeah. and Kawhi holding up uh, the Larry O'Brien um, statue. Um, you know, you coached the Raptors from 2008 to 2011. And yeah. I know you're a stand-up dude, but um, yeah. is this moment bittersweet for you? Uh, I mean, it is. I mean, it's great. It's great to see the organization do well. It really is. I mean, and because so many of the people are the same that were there then. And you want to see people that you worked with in the past have the success that they're having right now. I look at that last shot though, and I'm still like uh, the celebrations and everything and how great it is and people on the court is one thing, but you know, I, we can't underestimate Kawhi's shot. I mean, that was phenomenal because he had to change, he shoots a pretty flat shot normally. So he changed the trajectory of the shot because he had to get it over top of Embiid and then mm -hmm. to have it hit the rim and be as soft as it was. I mean, that's a lot of hours in the gym. And mm -hmm. I think you see things like that, you, you just kind of respect the game and, and what he's been able to do. And having played the game and coached, um, how big is this moment for Canadian basketball? That's huge. I mean, I, I, I still think that, you know, what introduced us to the game and the growth of the game in this country was the NBA coming here and having a player like Vince Carter uh, be able to uh, be on highlights every night and kids growing up. And it was kids like Corey Joseph and Tristan Thompson and Kelly Olynyk. those guys growing up watching somebody on the news every night who was putting out their out, out highlights. And then the next stage was probably a guy like Steve Nash who said and showed for Canadians, this is possible. And mm -hmm. uh, I, can an be the, I can be the MVP two years in a row in this league. And I think that just vaulted more Canadians. And I think what's happening now is the next step. I mean, we're gonna see another generation that is now transfixed on watching the Raptors and the love of basketball. And it might be 10, 15 years, but this group of players is gonna just, or, or people that are watching right now are gonna turn into the, the next wave of Canadians. And we're even seeing it now, like the, this year's draft, there's gonna be four or five more. We have more Canadians playing in the NBA than any other uh, country other than the United States. And, and so it's an all time high. So the, the sport is just growing in this country and this is just gonna accelerate that even more. I wanna talk to you about the upcoming draft, but um, I wanna go back a little bit about your time, the time that you spent coaching the Raptors. Yeah. And I found this so interesting that you wrote in the book, you wrote, I'd always had the doubt in the back of my mind that can, my Canadian background was somehow the reason for my being kept around, mm -hmm. kept around uh, the Raptors organization. Yeah. Why did you feel like that? I think, you know, I only got the chance to start in the NBA in Vancouver because I was Canadian and um, I did broadcasting and we wanted to introduce uh, the sport to Canadians. And so I was a high profile Canadian player at the time or, a, or, or coach and that was the way it started. And then when I came to Toronto, 
um, I, I, I started thinking, oh, this is, I did it in Vancouver and I did it in Toronto. Um, do I need to do it somewhere else to just not be the token Canadian? And I think, uh, I, you know, I just kind of had those doubts. And I remember talking to Brian Colangelo at the time and he, he got really mad. He was at the GM. Me. Right? Yeah, yeah, he got mad at me. I said that. I said, because I, I said, I think I need to go somewhere else to expand my career and coach somewhere else. And he said, why? And, he, and I said, just because I don't want to be the Canadian in the Canadian city. And he said, and he got mad. He said, I, I would never keep you because you're Canadian. And that kind of gave me a feeling and a little bit of confidence. And then, you know, and, and then since then, I've been able to move to, you know, Portland and Phoenix and now Charlotte. So, uh, I, but I always had that, that a little initial self-doubt at the beginning. But, you know, it's interesting. Um, uh, an American playing in the NBA uh, mm -hmm. in America would never think that. Right. right? No, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. no, um, I, uh, you played a lot of sports growing up, mm -hmm. but um, when did you know that basketball was a sport for you? Um, I, w I loved hockey. I mean, I, every Canadian, we grew up playing hockey, and I, I grew about five or six inches one summer, mm -hmm. and I got knocked off my skates, and I couldn't keep up with everybody and, and the physicality of the game, and I thought, oh, boy, I'm getting taller. But And then basketball became something that I just, like, I, I moved towards and uh, um, you know my dad was a high school coach so I always started playing in the gyms there and then I had a little bit of success because of this new growth spurt and mm. from that point on it was like fun it was fun you, know, you, you have success doing something it becomes fun and, yeah do you think that because you grew up in a small town in Ontario mm -hmm. but it was a border town yeah. do you think that had any role for you like oh, for so sure. because we're talking about kids in Canada yeah. seeing what uh, Canadian uh, players can do in the league yeah do you think that being able to see that um, put that seed in your mind I think so I, I think um, you know it, it added to it I mean the Buffalo Braves were fairly close to where I grew up so that was like my NBA team but um, the Niagara region was always a real hotbed I mean uh, Jim the late Jimmy Rose had coached off the champion there and the basketball high school basketball was big and it's kind of what I grew up on it was like a Friday night that was the thing to do is to go to high school games even before I was participating in them but um, you know with Niagara University right across the the river um, being in that area you had a, an NCAA team to follow and then the Buffalo Braves being in Buffalo so the, you had the proximity to the NBA game and just much like I said earlier with Canadian kids growing up and, and, and having the Raptors or the Vancouver Grizzlies when you when you can see it all the time and when you can be you can part dream of it. it you can dream it yeah, yeah. absolutely um, but your goal was to play for Team Canada but not the mm -hmm. NBA yeah. why was that I don't I don't I didn't know if that was possible at the time I, I really didn't I didn't uh, um, think about the NBA I mean I, I was like okay I'm gonna play for my country and that's what you did when you graduated from university and started playing and uh, I had uh, I had you know three NBA tryouts, uh, but um, you got drafted. Yeah, I got drafted. I, I mean, that must have been cool. It was really cool. It yeah. was except I always I always say back then they had eight rounds. So <laughs> there were a lot of there were a lot of people who didn't even play the game that were getting drafted back then. So I I wasn't like oh uh, you know I got drafted by the defending champion the Los Angeles Lakers, but it was in the eighth round, so it doesn't really uh, matter a whole lot. But it, it you know I did it, it, that showed that I. I had made a mark on that. Um, I obviously tried to play in the NBA, but ended up playing overseas, and, and it became a real passion for me mm -hmm. to, to represent Canada. Uh, We've got a picture to show you. I don't know if you recognize this uh, young man. I was, I was uh, yeah. <laughs> trash talking. You say you had a lot of hair. This is from 1983 at the mm -hmm. World University Games. Yeah. Um, why was that moment so special? Well, it was one of the first times we got a chance to play in Canada. I mean, we had always played most of our international games on the road, and. Um, it was a surprise because the we beat the United States in the semifinals of that game, and and that team was loaded mm -hmm. with great players. Um, Charles Barkley to this day talks about losing that game to Canada and how devastated they were at the time. But they had Carl Malone and Ed Pinkney, guys that went on to have, you know, great NBA careers, mm -hmm. um, and it was a big thing for us to beat them in the semifinals. And I think, at the same time, to win the gold medal the next day against Yugoslavia, who was the defending world champions at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and to do that on Canadian soil was really special. Because you have a quote in the book, and I've heard it before. Well, I mean, Americans did not invent the game, but the quote is, Americans invented the game and Yugoslavia perfected it, right? Yeah, was, yes. I mean, Yugoslavia was so, so good at that time. And, and uh, uh, Drajan Dalapajic, and, and, and they had, you know, guys that 
were, were very, very good international players, maybe not known mm -hmm. like they international players are known today. But um, to beat them in the gold medal game was, was really exciting, too. But I think the big win that put us on the map was beating the United States and uh, a star-studded team. And having that bragging right, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. um, well, you played, um, you played uh, against Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. uh, who a lot of people say is the yeah. greatest to ever play the game. Right. But he knocked you out. Can yeah, you tell us yeah, that story? No, yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, it was... Uh, it's interesting that I, that I work for him now too, and, we, and we've we've talked about this. But uh, you know, he was the guy that we played against in the Pan American Games and in the Olympics in 1984, and mm -hmm. uh, I had to guard him. And I remember uh, Jack Donahue telling me, he said, "You got to keep him in front of you, and if a shot goes up, do not turn to box him out. He's so athletic; he'll he'll swim around you, and he'll get to the guy. So just." keep hitting him. So I, I boxed him out like a lineman would a, in football. I just kept hitting him, hitting him, hitting him. And I always had, you know, try to lock an arm if I could on the free throw line. And I locked an arm and once and kind of got mad and shook it away and I did it again. And he waited and the whole game was so patient until the last like 10 seconds to go. And I think they were up 10, 15 points. And I locked the arm and I let it go. And I saw the ball was going in after I locked the second one and he, I let it go. And he just, boom, hit me with his elbow right in the mouth and knock me out. So it's embarrassing, but at the same time, if I've only been knocked out once in my life and it was by Michael Jordan, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a good story, right? Yeah, yeah it's a good story. <laughs> uh, you played as Simon Fraser uh, mm -hmm. in uh, BC, yeah. um, and you that's where you met Terry Fox, and right. you had a great relationship with him. Mm -hmm. What was your first impression of him when you first met him? I was just in awe. Like, here's, here's a, and, and not because he had done anything at the time, just mm -hmm. because of, um, his will, he had just lost the leg and was waiting for a prosthetic leg uh, at the time and he kept talking about lifting weights and training still and uh, uh, he, he told us I'm going to run across Canada, I have to do something to stop the suffering that I saw and I was like okay, and, you know, sure everybody's got these dreams and, he, and he, every day to see him every day work, 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 work and then he said yeah I'm going to start the run and then to watch him go on the run and you know, we, we became friends throughout all the training and he was part of our basketball team there. So I just feel so fortunate that I was able to meet this guy and then watch him change what he had talked about a dream into a reality of trying to run across Canada and how it inspired so many Canadians because he inspired me before he even started the run. What did you take from that friendship? Because he, you and first met him when you were, you were feeling a bit homesick. Yeah, I, yeah. I went into the office. I think I was homesick. I was, you know, three thousand miles away from home. I go in, and I'm homesick. And here's a guy, and I just thought, oh, here's a guy. Now he's got a bigger problem than I do. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just lost his leg and his dream of playing basketball. Um, so that, I think that was the connection. It was like a reality check for me. Like, you know, don't other people have issues too. You know, let's. You know, stay focused on what you're trying to do. And here I was thinking I was training so hard to become an Olympian for Canada, riding on the bus to go up and get shots up. And then I'd see him wheeling his wheelchair up Burnaby Mountain. I was like, I don't, I don't even compare to this guy. And I think it just, it set a standard and a bar for me uh, as to if you really want something, what are you going to do to do it? And then I as watching him, it was just motivation and a plan mm -hmm. uh, to perfection as to you know, how to, how to be great. Uh, you eventually retired from playing basketball mm -hmm. and became a coach. Yeah. Um, from everything that I hear about coaching, it's everybody loves you when you win, everybody hates you yeah. when you lose. Why did you want to coach? Uh, I, I wanted to stay in the game. Mm -hmm. And I think the opportunity to give back, like I, I had coaches that shaped me and shaped my life. And if I can help a, another athlete uh, do that. And I think when I coached the Canadian team, uh, in the 2000 Olympics, to me, that was so much more rewarding mm -hmm. than playing in the Olympics because I had helped take 12 players uh, to represent their country the way that I felt so proud to represent Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's why you coach. I mean, uh, uh, we, there's a brotherhood amongst that group that played in the Olympics in 2000 that will never be broken. And um, to be part of that and to shape it and organize it and form it, that was, that was really important for me. Um, when, while I when you were coaching at Simon Fraser University, uh, you were trying to recruit Steve Nash. Yeah. Uh, what stood out about his game? Well, I went to, I was with the uh, national team watching them practice and I went back to the gym because there was a summer league going on and I saw this kid flying down and he was like, he, he was, he threw up a left-handed mm -hmm. layup and, it went, and I, was, I said to the guy I was with, I said, who's that grade 10 left-handed kid? 
And they go, there's no left-handed kid there. And I was like, well, that kid there, he just, he go, no, he, oh, that's Steve Nash. He's right-handed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my goodness, I need to put his name on my recruiting list. So then I started recruiting him and I followed him all the time. It, it, recruiting is tough. I mean, you, you, you follow these kids, you get to know them as you follow them. But I, I, I watched him play rugby. I watched him play soccer and watched him play basketball. And he was like the MVP mm -hmm. in the province for all three sports. So he was just a great athlete. And mm -hmm. he was a guy that I wanted to recruit. You recruit the best players that you can. And, uh, um, I tried to recruit him and didn't get him. But you also, well, even like within that path, um, I want to show you a clip of Steve Nash in a mm -hmm. second, but even within that path, you have to get these players to trust you mm -hmm. as a recruiter, as a coach. Sure. How do you get them to trust you? to trust you and then to trust each other when they're when they are on the court. I think the biggest thing is to be completely honest and you can't fool people. I mean, be who you are and be completely honest. And I think I was when I recruited Steve and told him you probably need to go higher than Simon Fraser University. You need to play at the NCAA level mm -hmm. if your goal is to play in the NBA. And he said, oh, I appreciate that. Uh, if it doesn't work out, I'll come back and play for you. And then while we were sitting there talking, he even said, I'm, he said, I'm going to play for you because you, you told me your dream was to coach in the Olympics and I want to play in the Olympics, so I'm going to play for you eventually. And sure enough, we walked into opening ceremonies in, in Sydney with our arms around each other going, we said we were going to do this. This is really cool. Right. Um, but I, I just think that you, a trust and communication and honesty are the things. And those are, those are things that, are, that should be part of our life anyway. Mm -hmm. like, but if you have that within a team and, and you're not trying to play games with people, I think that's where the trust builds a you know, positive team. Well, um, before the NBA Finals were played in Toronto, the NBA All-Star Weekend that took place, that was like the biggest thing that happened uh, with the NBA and the city of Toronto. Yeah. Um, we have a clip of Steve Nash talking about the growth of the game in the country. Sheldon, please roll. It's an amazing kind of culmination of this golden era for us. You know, we had the, the Raptors and Grizzlies come to Canada you know, a few decades, a couple decades ago. Uh, the game, because of that, has grown so much. And we see that in all these young NBA players we have now from Canada. You've got to think, when I came in the league, they were, um, some of them were two, three, four. Some of them were just being born. Um, they grew up in a city or a country that had NBA basketball every night on TV, which we didn't have when I was growing up. Uh, there was hoops and driveways. People wanted to coach. People wanted to sign up for youth leagues. So the game just changed and took on a, a different trajectory. I think also the internet, you know, it, it, it really had an impact on our kids saying, you know, that's, that's how Ray Allen works out. I want to do that. Or that's the best player in the States in my class. I'm going to be better than him. And then, you know, so on top of that, to watch the Raptors take another level as a professional franchise, to have the NBA All-Star Game here in Canada as the first All-Star Game outside of the United States has been a fantastic culmination of this golden era. So you worked for both the Grizzlies when they were in Vancouver. They're yeah. in Memphis now, yeah. and the Raptors. Um, how has the image of basketball changed since the mid-90s to now? I just think that it's become so much high, more high profile, like, mm -hmm. and not just in Canada, but around the world. I mean, we've got more international players playing. We've got more Canadian mm -hmm. players playing. And I think the game has just grown exponentially uh, with the number of participants and the number uh, and, and the way the game's played. I mean, the, the analytics and the studying of the game, it, the game has been broken down and we've seen what might have been great basketball 15, 20 years ago is completely different than the way the game's being played now with the three-point shot mm -hmm. and with the distance that people are, are, are shooting it. But um, I, think, I think everybody, and Steve mentioned it in there, I think, I think the internet and the, uh, the ability to almost find almost anything, even coaches. Um, mm -hmm. If I want to see a play, I can type in something and uh, I will get 100 of those plays. And that's how you develop a strategy as a coach. And it's becoming more um, open for everybody to, to receive all that. And I think that's where, I mean, the keenness of people to keep learning and, and as the game grows. Uh, the game changes all the time. And I, I think people are, are on top of it. Well, I mean, to, uh, you recently stepped down. Um, you were the coach for mm -hmm. the senior men's national team. Yeah. Um, but why did you step down? Because, I mean, we have the talent, we have... Yeah. You know, and I know in the book you wrote, you wrote about how excited you were about no, it. No, and, and I, I, I was. I, I, I was excited about it. It was just, uh, it was just a, a little bit of a conflict, uh, you know, that I have had. And just, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's in the right position to move forward right now. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved to have been a part of it, but um, other people thought differently. And I was like, it's okay. I mean, I... Um, I work for Charlotte and they pay me and to take time off to do that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can commit back to them 100%. So it's disappointing for me, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it's... Uh, so it's not your decision? 
It was not. It was my decision to step back. Yes. Okay. Um, I know but, you're very diplomatic. Um, yeah. No, it was my decision to step back, just because of the way things uh, were handled. But it's it's all good. I mean, I, I'm, I'm the players are are all in, and we're we're ready, and we've qualified. And um, the new system is not conducive for people working in the NBA, really. I mean, because. Mm -hmm. You know, Roy Rana did a great job helping us qualify, and we had Gord Herbert who helped us qualify, and I coached some of the windows to help us qualify for the world championships. And I just don't know if it's right to have so many coaches coach, mm -hmm. and, and but that's the way the FIBA game is going, and um, we're one of the best teams in the world right now, mm -hmm. and we're going to be. You're a competitor, a mm -hmm. player, coach. Yeah. Um, does that urge to compete ever go away? No. I mean, it's... I don't know. It, I don't know if it ever will. I think, you know... Even as a coach, you try to create plays and drills and things that will help make guys better. And uh, that, I think that's what keeps you going. I think when you lose that competitiveness, uh, the players find out. And I think it's the competitiveness that makes them want to be coached. Because uh, they all want to want to try to win. They all want to try to get that next contract and, and go as far as they can in the sport. And you better have that same type of uh, uh, compete in you mm -hmm. if you're gonna if you're gonna you know be able to connect with them. We only have a few minutes left, and I want to get another, a few more questions in. Mm -hmm. um, this year's draft will include a handful of Canadians. Mm -hmm. A name that keeps coming up is R.J. Barrett, and you actually played with his dad. Yeah. Um, what does his future look like? Oh, it's going to be great. He, he, we, we had him on a Canadian national team last summer uh, for part of the qualifying, and uh, we had NBA players on that group, and he not only fit in but just stood out mm -hmm. amongst the NBA players already. He hadn't even gone to college. So I, I think that he's got a great upside. He's a great kid. He's coachable. Had a great year at Duke. And uh, this next month is going to be super exciting for him because he'll, he'll be a top pick in the draft. Um, uh, Jack Donahue's mantra, uh, dream big dreams, yeah. is tattooed on your arm. And I know yeah. he played like a, he was a huge, he played a huge influence on your life. Yeah. Um, what do those words mean to you? Uh, it, I think it, it, it goes back to that. It goes back to Terry Fox. You know, you have these dreams and you write it down. Jack always talked to us about having a dream, writing it down, uh, putting it where you can see it all the time, mm -hmm. and telling people about it. And if you do those things, then it becomes more than just the dream that's in your head uh, because you become more committed to it. And um, to me, that's everything that I've done, everything that I've tried to do, I've, I've tried to follow that, you know, and I've had big dreams. And, you know, to be the first Canadian coach in the NBA was, was big for me, to go to take 12 players to the Olympics. Those are things that I had written down that I wanted to achieve, and uh, I still have more. And I, I just, I, you know, to me, the, Jack and Terry kind of um, created that dream, big dreams for me. Um, when all is said and done, mm -hmm. what do you want your legacy to be? I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I if if you go okay. I want this to be my legacy. I think I think it's a, a, it's something that other people will perceive about you for you. Mm -hmm. And I and and I, you know, being honest and caring and hardworking and all the qualities that you kind of have, um, a competitor. Those those are things that you are. But it's it's how I think when you talk a legacy, I don't think you talk about yourself. I think it's how other people view you. Well, Jay, uh, Coach Jay, <laughs> it's, it's weird to call you Jay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, uh, that was Jay Triano, uh, the assistant coach for the Charlotte Hornets and the author of Open Look. Thank you for making the time for us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.